Cool. Very, very good. All right. Well, so let's let's talk a little bit uh, more about where you're at. So um, if you can connect the dots a little bit and tell us how you how we're coming to um, Judgment Day begins May 21st. And I know that there's 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 a lot to it. So if you can, you know, condense it into, you know, three to five minutes where people can, can try to follow. It, it starts with how do you interpret the Bible? And so the quick rundown on that is uh, the Bible, God presents information in the Bible to us in figures and patterns and parables, what we call a proverb or a parable, a metaphor, an allegory. And so there are many pictures in the Bible about uh, spiritual matters. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jesus is the sacrifice uh, of the Old Testament, so to speak, and uh, I can get carried away with that and talk a long time about that. Sure. However, uh, the flood is a big picture of Judgment Day. And we read about that in Matthew 24, where Jesus says, uh, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be. We read about that in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, where God goes on to talk about the flood and how it's, uh, the world then was destroyed by water, and the world to come will be destroyed by fire. So uh, the uh, flood as a picture is, in, is important, as a picture of judgment. There are time paths in the Bible which point to 2011. Uh, there's a calendar in the Bible, essentially. All the time statements of the Bible are perfectly accurate because it is the Bible. And so the most simple to understand, three to five minute mm-hmm. uh, explanation, and it's built on a lot of other information, but it's simple to understand is Second Peter 3, 8. Uh, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. Now that verse is sandwiched in the context of Uh, the flood of Noah's day and judgment to come at the end by fire. We find the same idea in Psalm 90, verse 2, where uh, God is saying, a a day of old with you is as a thousand years when it is past. I'm paraphrasing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, again, he's talking about the flood. Thou carriest them away as with a flood or a river. And then he goes on to talk about God's wrath. So the idea that a day with the Lord is a thousand years in the Bible, which is there twice, is both times in the context of the flood and judgment. And we have a statement in the Bible in Genesis 7, 4, which says, uh, God speaking to Noah, for yet seven days I will cause it to rain. He's telling him he'll bring the flood in seven days. Mm -hmm. And when we expand that out to 7,000 years to see what we get, you know, as we're trying to work this out, it's 7,000 years after the flood, which was in 4990 B.C., is 2011. And that's this year. And May 21, on the... uh, Hebrew calendar, the Jewish calendar, which is governed by the moon, that is May 21 is the 17th day of the second month. And when you read Genesis 7, 11 through 16, you'll find that is the day Noah got into the ark, and the, or, or at least that the door of the ark was closed by God. Again, another picture. So that in a nutshell, real quick, is a little bit of information about it. So it would seem that, that um, having... Folks who are not getting to the same point that you're getting wouldn't take those um, the day as a thousand days a- as literal. What what makes you confident that, that that is to be taken as a literal um, as a literal translation or, or depiction from God saying this is the time that it's going to be? Really, the main reason would be uh, because of the hermeneutic or method of Bible interpretation, at which which says to us God speaks to us in figures of speech, in metaphors, in in similitudes and figures he's he's giving us spiritual meaning uh, of things with earthly figures that we can see but he's talking about spiritual things in them um does that make sense does that answer your question yeah i I see what you're saying so let me ask this look when do you uh at what where did you get to there how did you get to this point um i mean is it is it the research that you had done on your own is it based upon um research that, that other folks have done like how did you get to this point where you feel like that like that you're confident in that date well, certainly I did not come with, up with this stuff all by myself. Uh, I've read the works of other people, mm-hmm. primarily Harold Camping of Family Radio, the president and manager. However, uh, when you're going to tell people May 21 is the day of the rapture and the beginning of Judgment Day, you ought to do your homework sure. and double-check what people are Somebody saying. Somebody might say, what? <laughs> <laughs> right, and so I had the uh, opportunity to do that. and. As I went through and studied the information, I found this is the way it is going to be. I, I concur with this. I concur with this. 
So, um, you know, and, and I don't think any of these questions are necessarily going to surprise you here. One of, the, one of the things that comes up when you mention a guy like Harold Camping is, his, is a previous prediction of the end of the world in 1994. Um, you, what the, the Bible says, you know, when you talk about a prophet, you know, um, if, he, if he gives a prophecy and it doesn't, make, it doesn't happen, that man is a false prophet and you can disregard him. So how do we get – so if, if, if his work and, and some of his study is kind of what brings us to this point, how can, uh, how can we trust a person who, biblically standing, would otherwise be considered a false prophet? But does he actually qualify uh, for what we read in Deuteronomy about a false prophet? And uh, it, it, it makes me hesitant to talk about him because he, he yeah. can be asked himself about sure. you know, things like this. But I can say – uh, to be a false prophet according to Deuteronomy, I think it's 18, I can't remember the exact chapter, but there's two separate chapters that talk about different aspects of being a false prophet. And um, the one that we're, you're talking about now is if a prophet presumed to speak a word in the name of the Lord and the thing he has said doesn't come to pass and, and so yeah. forth. Yeah. And so that what that's talking about is uh, saying you have heard from God a word and then telling others it came from God and this is what God has said. And uh, Harold Camping, for example, has not done that. He has not said, I have a vision from God, an, an articulated message that came to me, and, uh, and this is what it was. Mm -hmm. that was what a, that's what the Bible is talking about I, there. I, I think that's probably pretty thin, though, because, I mean, he's, he's basing, well, I won't say him, I'll say you, uh, but is basing most of the uh, presumption on, on the date on God's word, the Bible. The Bible is, you know, concurrently you know, referred to as God's word. So what's the difference between a vision and God's perfect handbook that he's given us to live by? Well, the, then the difference would be, uh, was he right in his interpretation? We have the Bible. That's the word of God. Yep. And we give that to people. We, we can say, because it's true, this is the word of God, mm -hmm. the Bible. But then it's a matter of interpretation. And every Bible teacher ever has been wrong about something in their interpretation. And we don't go around calling them all false prophets. But true. So, That's fair. Uh, yeah, no, that is fair. So I guess at this point, what um, – it's, it's the confidence that, that I guess yeah, I'm Yeah, it's, it's like the statement, the Bible guarantees. I think that's the, that's the, that's the rub, right? Because you can make a, 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 an error in interpretation with the Bible – and, yeah, and and just be wrong, you know, with and still have the love of Christ in your heart and want to see everyone, you know, see salvation uh, flourish and uh, without making a bold statement like my interpretation is the interpretation. This is the only way to see it. The Bible guarantees. I think that's that's the rub. OK, and that's fair. However, what choice do we have when that's what we understand from the Bible? And we have passages in the Bible to we're mandated to declare the word of God. And this is how we see what the word of God is saying to us. And we're talking, a lot of us talk now about Ezekiel 33, in which God is telling Ezekiel, as a watchman on the coast of Israel, when you see the sword approaching, you warn the people. And if you don't, you're in trouble. I'm obviously paraphrasing. Yeah, yeah. But you can read that in Ezekiel 33. And also Ezekiel 3 has the same thing. And what's the pattern God gives us when God uh, says to Jonah, look, you go to, to Nineveh, and you tell him in 40 days I'm going to destroy it. What happened to Jonah when he didn't do it? Yep. He got in trouble with God in a big way. And so eventually he ended up doing what he was supposed to do. Well, and I think it's accurate to say, I mean, we do have a pattern of, of God warning. I mean, Noah had a chance to warn people, of which they ignored. So I, I think this is all, um, this is all familiar work from God. Uh, let me ask you this. There was, and, and, and I, I'm not sure that I quite understood it, but one of the things um, I, I was trying to it's not a specialty of mine, so uh, maybe you can help educate me. But there was a, parts of this that sounded uh, the end of the church age. Um, and it basically, uh, the, from what I read, it's, you know, the people that were in the local churches over the last, I don't know, what, 20 years or whatever, um, you are, are, not, are not saved. Am, am, I, am I catching that correctly? Uh, if they are saved, they will be coming out of the churches. That would be an addendum I would add to that. They, they would have left the churches. The believers now are leaving the local congregations, and I'm very uh, understanding that that is not a happy idea. Oh, sure. So uh, how, I guess the, my question then is how would that be consistent with the church as Christ's bride? Well, the Bible speaks about, the, uses the word church in two, in two different ways. There's the eternal church, right, that consists of all the true believers. 
Then you have this organism called the local congregations, and just because you go to that, that doesn't mean you're saved because you're a part of that, right? You can have membership in sure. the local church right. and not be saved. Yeah. So what church is in view, you have to kind of study out based on the context and other things the Bible says about how church is being used, that word in the Greek, ecclesia or whatever, uh, in the context and how the Bible is using the other figures surrounding it. So uh, the Bible anticipates problems in the local congregations. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's the answer to that, is that there's two different churches, the eternal church and the local visible church. And you can't be involved in both? You can't have an, be a membership of the eternal body of Christ and still be in a local church? During the church age, you absolutely could. I mean, that was God's method of operation, was to use the churches to further the gospel. But the Bible anticipates a time when that uh, program would stop. And in which God, at the end of that program, summons his people out of the local congregations. And so I have to say, sadly, now, no, you cannot be a member of the local congregations and expect to be in the kingdom of God. And I, uh, I know how you know, odd that must be. Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess my... my I guess my direct question is is that, that your membership within or not within a local church now negates your faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and died for your sins? Like that that, that one caveat takes you out of the kingdom of heaven now? No, it's, it's the same as any other command. We have command in the Bible to leave the congregation. Uh, we've all had commands to not lie, to love your neighbor as yourself, to love the Lord your God with all your strength, and all kinds of commands in the Bible. And we, if you're a believer, you are going to be obedient to those commands. And so it's not that being a part of a local congregation negates salvation or your beliefs. It's more of an indication if you're there, it is a flag that you are not saved and have not become saved. So what is the, maybe let's get back to rudimentary details here. What is, how is, how is somebody saved? So, <laughs> I mean, how is somebody saved and then how does that translate to, I didn't leave the church? And that, and that, that means that I'm, I'm not hearing God and, and I'm not going to make it. Someone is saved when God gives them a new spirit, when they're born from above. Uh, we, I think we read about that in John 3. And uh, the Bible says that God is a spirit. Those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The Bible says in a different place, uh, that which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. So we know that rebirth, that regeneration, is a spiritual one. When you're saved, your flesh doesn't change. It's an inward change. Mm -hmm. And that's what salvation is, is being given that new, at least for what we're talking about now, yep. salvation is getting that new inner inner workings, the new spiritual man, the inward man uh, God talks about in Romans 7. So God is in charge of when that happens. And uh, he will carry that out in an elect person's life whenever he sees fit to, uh, to save them. And when someone is saved because of... Uh, because that work is God's work. Because we read in an example in First John uh, chapter 3, that which is born of God cannot commit sin. And like verses I've already said indicate it's the spirit that's born again. It's that inward man that's born again, and it's born of God. That which is born of God cannot commit sin. So inwardly, you cannot sin. And we'll, you know, because of that, you'll grow in grace. You'll begin to have a want to, to... Be obedient more and more to the Word of God. The Bible describes characteristics of a, a true believer, like um, Psalm 1, I suppose, Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, and so forth, mm -hmm. but his law is in the, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And So there's characteristics of a believer given in the Bible, and we are to scrutinize our lives to see are we meeting that threshold. Sure. So, so when, when I mean, I'm trying to follow you and I'm processing all this stuff, so w does a person know if they're saved? I, I mean, I'm kind of confused the, of what, what point do you go from lost to Right, if you found? say, that, if you say that, that only God can make that change within you, do you... Uh, How do you know if you're part of the elect? Right. right. You, you know, I just, you know... No, sure, I understand. Uh, the hope of mankind, uns unsaved mankind, is they don't know if they're elect or not, right? Uh, if, you're, if you know you're not saved, you can't know, though, that you haven't been chosen by God to become saved. The Bible says the Holy Spirit witnesses with our spirit that we are sons of God, children of God. So the way we see if we are uh, is to scrutinize our, our um, lives against what the Bible says. The Bible says, prove yourselves whether ye be of the faith, 
um, excuse me, You're fine. examine yourselves, make your calling and election sure, and, and things like this. And we, so the Bible is like a ruler in that regard. We have the commands. Are we following them more and more? And as we do that, we can start to say, it looks like I'm a child of God. Why? Not because I'm so great, but because uh, I'm, I'm finding I want to follow the Bible more and more. Uh, 